Well, I'd like to say something about this picture. Because this picture is really revolutionary. What you see in the middle there is the zodiac. And what this picture says... We have somebody rattling there? Is it all okay? What this picture says <laughs> is that the zodiac isn't the whole of the 360 <laughs> degrees. That whatever is there in the 360 is more than the zodiac. And I tell you, I had some arguments with Tony's ghost about this picture until I actually proved it to him. And I'm sure that if he were alive when I came up with this, I would have had to prove some things to him because some of the things in here are quite revolutionary. So. What I want to show you is to show you a movie of how this picture is put together because it's really not so obvious looking at it, how it comes together. So, Dave, would you start right from the beginning of the movie and, yeah, and, sh and get to where we have the first nine-point star and then we'll see. Okay, stop. So what this is what this is is showing you is how this picture is built. These are nine pointed stars, and the number of the picture is 360. So there's 40 of them. 40 times nine is 360. And so what we're going to have here is that the outer go start the movie now. The outer ring is made up of 40 nine pointed stars, and they're all different mm. colors to make it pretty. Ooh. Yeah, let me. And this is how it's made. And you did all this for the moon. No, no, no. <laughs> I cheated. Do you want the overhead light off? Okay, and now you see how the 12 point. David, can you, sh can you uh, uh, blow the picture up? Uh, you'd have to use the, the mouse wheel. And blow the picture up with the point of it at um, no not there the, put the point at the edge of one of the of the 12 pointed star and blow it up from there blow it up more 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 and more so I want you to see how this thing works you see those are the nine pointed star that's enough there's the nine pointed stars coming together and the 12 pointed star is actually drawn using the nine pointed stars as it's as the lines to draw it with so what we're actually seeing is not just the 12 pointed star plopped down in the middle of it. We're seeing it's actually um, as a, a sub figure. So, what this is saying is the zo this is the way I want to translate it. the zodiac is one level of consciousness, and the nine pointed star represents a subtler or higher level of consciousness. And, and if you'll follow me, okay, now you can bring it back. If you could follow me this far. Let's say that the zodiac stands for the sum of human experience. And the nine pointed star stands for what? And I would say, and this is my guess, because I'm not a Plotinus scholar, but if you look at 117 in the Aeneids, where he's talking about the we, that that's what that nine pointed star refers to. And I'll present some evidences in the paper for that. So you're connecting yes. the title the work, the Aeneids, with the nine. Yeah. That could be. That could be. I hadn't thought of that. But I didn't see the nine on the twelve. I, I suspect I'm not the only one that missed it. Is it know. important to know that? Yeah. They blow again. it up again. With the point, yeah. That, just blow it up again. Right, right back there. I, it's hard for me to see it, too. Just blow it up. But he's had to show me this. <laughs> See that you see the lines, yeah. those those Make background up. lines, the cross hatch lines, yeah. are the lines that are made out of the nine pointed stars. Okay, and where that twelve pointed star is made, it's made on those lines. So can you show us the origins of the nine point lines? That might help us to understand. Maybe we should start back at the beginning. We need a pointer? Let's we'll start back at the beginning yeah. with a movie. Again. Is there a pointer? It's for not you? a pointer. Use the cursor. Cursor. I mean, for Lenny. Now you see, you see how the nine pointed stars are built up here. So is that an, an eagon in the center? 
Yeah. Well, it's a sequence of them because it's one after another, and it'll get blotted out after a while. Yeah, so there it's nine. Yeah. There it's nine. <coughs> but it'll be a 360 gone when it's done. Okay, play it now. Let's see. You see how all the crosshatched the all the crosshatched lines are made up of the nine pointed stars. That's going to evolve into the 12. The 12 is going to be drawn in the middle, at right the last, <coughs> right the last of it. So the nines are all drawn then, and there's the 12. Okay, and you can see, if when he blows it up, you can see that the, the 12 is made out of the same lines as the nines. So we could look at this as an illustration of dynamic extension. Yeah, you could. But what I'm trying to show is that there are, there are layers of consciousness here. That the 12 refers to the sum of human experience, and the 9 refers to the intelligible background against which human experience is projected. You know, we say, we act like we live in the same world. But we don't live in the same world. We live in a, a shared intelligibility. What we share is um, meanings. We live in a world where the meanings are shared. We don't, we don't share sensations. You don't have any idea what white looks like to me. You don't have any idea what Janet's face looks like to me. It doesn't look the same to you. We couldn't even compare them. What we can compare is our understanding of things, and that's where we live. So that nine refers to the shared intelligibility, and the 12 refers to human experience as we experience it in the foreground. And so what's revolutionary here is that the Zodiac is only a piece of the 360, and perhaps we would decide if we were um, a lot larger than we are, that it's only a minor piece. Okay? So that's what's revolutionary here. And this picture, this picture uh, literally blew my mind. I mean, I said, holy oh, shit. Look what's going on here. How many points are on the <laughs> What? How many points are on the circumference? 360. Ooh. Lenny, could you comment on your understanding of what you're meaning to communicate when you use the word revolutionary? I mean that I, the zodiac is something which I had, you know, the question, what is the zodiac? We use the word. And, and uh, we use it like, you know, like somebody's name, like a guy who lives next door. We don't actually think about it. And, and the question is, what is the Zodiac? And here this gives a perspective where I see the Zodiac as something finite against the background of something much larger. And I think that if I were to look larger than the nine, I would learn some things about the individual soul that would be quite, quite interesting indeed. And that what, what I'm looking at here is is uh, I'm looking at the individual soul and I'm looking at the zodiac which is sense experience, human experience, and then I'm looking beyond that. And to, you know, when we say the individual soul, we're speaking of something that's going to reincarnate, reincarnate, reincarnate until one day it's a planet. Until one day it's a star. The individual, the, the sun is an individual soul. The galaxy is an individual soul. So when we talk about the individual soul, we're talking about something that's quite enormous. And here we're talking about human experience, which to us is quite enormous, and yet in this picture it's rather something measured, something, something smaller. And, and that's what I'm trying to get at here. And this picture begins to suggest some of the measures of it. So I'm now thinking it might be helpful if we had some understanding of the etymology of the word zodiac. <laughs> Google it. Well, we do. Well, uh, I, I suspect it's going to come from uh, from the from the idea of I don't know about the Greek, but does it translate into zoology? What I'm seeing is the There's a circle of animals. Circle of animals. Yeah, exactly they, that's what I'm Plato saying. called it, the circle of animals. And so then, what this then would represent, the zodiac, would be the animal life of the cosmos and its configurations in the zodiac from the point of view of the earth. 
That sounds good. You know, Dia, Dio, God. Dia is goddess. Yeah, so it's a circle of animals looked at as a god or Okay. Yeah, that there's something something like that, but but we I think we have to be um, gentle with this notion because we're still I don't think I have an answer to a question what what is the zodiac I think what I'm doing is asking the question in certain geometric ways so that it becomes something that's more friendly and it's not just it's not just a uh, yeah what's the zodiac she lives next door you know I mean okay so and this to, the revolutionary part about this was it actually says the 360 is larger than the zodiac. The three, I'm not, this doesn't suggest that the 40 degree angle should be incorporated in astrology. The zodiac is the limit of astrology. The 40 degree angle is something else. The, the nine is something else. It's not about astrology. Astrology ends at the zodiac. Are you, are you seeing that in the geometry because the, the points of the 12 planet star don't reach to the circumference? They don't, no. This, these, if I look at the angles here, the, if I look at a 360 point star in general, you'll see one, this one at the end of this paper. You could have a 360 point star where the angle is 179 degrees between the points, which means it goes almost all the way across. And these, in the nine-point star, the angle is 160 degrees. In the 12-point star, the angle is 150 degrees. Yes, in the five-point star, the angle is 144 degrees. These all sit inside each other, and they talk about levels of consciousness that sit inside each other and are, so the lower levels are objective to the higher levels. So that if I would think of somebody who lived in the nine, whatever that means, the whole of human experience would be objective to that person. So you can imagine, oh, PB must have lived in the nine, whatever that is, or, or above that, whatever. But, but when, we're, when we're conjecturing about levels of consciousness that are above our own, we're just talking. Yeah? So really, I don't want to just talk. I mean, I, I'm, the picture just suggests, yeah? Everybody have a seat. Anybody want to come in here? This, this, yeah, this, uh, sit up there in front. this room up here in front. Why don't some of you come in? Because it's it's uh, it's way back there. Come on. Why don't you come in and make yourself comfortable in this room? Please, you don't, certainly don't want to have to stand up back there. Randy, I found your question very suggested to me was the idea when Anthony would take the first part of the dignities and screen them around the outside Good. of the metaphysical mandala in the sense that unity is not symbolized explicitly in the metaphysical chart that the ultimate unity lies outside the chart. Yes, I'm not talking about unity. Everything here starts with the triangle. I'm not talking about about unity at all. I'm, I'm starting from the triangle. Well, starting from the triangle, what this symbolism seems to suggest to me is working from the, from the not the inside out, but from, from the bottom up. From the bottom up. From nature. From, from the bottom up. Toward right. the ultimate concentration. Okay. Any other questions about this picture? I'm, this I have lots of questions about this picture myself. Every time I draw it, and I've drawn this picture a lot of times with different colors and different different feelings about it. And every time I draw this picture, I get another feeling. So I'm not in any way done with a picture like this. It's it's too big. So can I move on to the paper? Is that good? Anybody? So why don't you David? Why don't you put the paper up? Yeah, okay. So this paper starts with this picture. And, okay. So I'm going to, I'm actually going to read some of the paper out loud, it's just, especially at the beginning. This paper is really a long poem. And uh, I don't want you to think that I'm really saying something very intellectual here. I'm writing a poem here about the nature of selfhood. And um, 
I think that if you really understand this poem, that you should write your own poem. Okay, because it won't look the same to you as it looks to me. You're certainly not a geometer, not a mathematician. You'll have a very different feeling for what the levels of selfhood are. But what I want to suggest to you that that there are levels of selfhood and that we should understand them better, and where we might understand them better. Okay, so stop me anytime you want. Okay. So this picture. Is a complex 360 pointed star. So it shows a 12 pointed star hanging against the background of 49 pointed stars. The coloring of this and other drawings is not usually designed to illustrate any particular meaning but to draw out the underlying beauty. Okay, so I'm confessing that. And in the appendix, if you, if you have this paper, if you look in the appendix, there's some more interesting things about these stars. So I interpret this star as a view of the individual mind, where in the full expansion of the individual view, the zodiac appears against the background of the shared intelligibility of life. Okay, now, human lives are at different levels. We live in very different worlds, but because of the shared underlying intelligibility, it's easy to assume a false sameness of these worlds. We kind of generally assume that the person next to us is living in the same world as we. And that works for some things. But for other things, it really doesn't work at all. Okay? Excuse me, Lenny. Do you want David to scroll the... Yeah, scroll David. <laughs> some of our different worlds are parallel, but some are hierarchical. And the hierarchy I'm talking about is the levels of self -will. Okay, so even in a spiritual community, that's us where it's a common place that the teacher's at a different level of consciousness from the flock. This isn't really understood. And the students, that's us, we don't have a real grasp of the different levels among ourselves. It's common practice, for example, to criticize those living at lower levels than oneself, presuming that one's own level of life is the universal human condition. From this view, what's obvious to me should be obvious to anyone else since there's nothing special about me, right? And I'm sure you've said that or felt that when you felt some criticism of somebody who doesn't get something, which is quite obvious to you. And uh, I reject this view. There's something special about everyone, and it's called the soul. And I accept that there are different levels of human consciousness, different levels of soul, <coughs> different levels of light, and I want to give you a geometric view to describe some of them which will suggest to you that perhaps you have your own way of describing these different levels. Okay, so the first level I want to talk about is ordinary life uncentered. And this is, uh, this is what the television is pointed at. So, and what I've got pictured here is a square and a triangle separate. Okay, and the idea of ordinary life is that the square and triangle are separate. The square, the square refers to life as a struggle, and the trying refers to life as something that is, something that can be understood. And I have my talents and the things that I can do, and that I have the things that I struggle at. Or I have the things that I understand, and I know what they are, and I have the things where I have to keep asking, well, what is this, what is this? And I can try and make it be what it what I think it is, but it doesn't it keeps not working. Okay, that's the square. It keeps not working. I have to struggle with it and work at it, and maybe eventually I get to what I'm what I think I was building. And the triangle is, I keep building it. I keep building it. It works, right? And the tri this triangle in the square is where is where we all live in the triangle in the square. But at this lower level, they're unrelated. I call it ordinary life uncentered. So at this level, my struggles and my goals are unrelated and only vaguely understood. And I, I, we know a lot of people like this. I don't think many in this group. But, but we all, you could see we all have this level in ourselves where this is happening. So I don't notice that my anger, fear, shame is a factor influencing events in my life. My successes, this is really harsh for a lot of people, my successes don't heal my emotional wounds. 
I have a success, and I go back to feeling the same way I did before. Mm. Things are largely unconnected. Things happen to me, and largely without anything but a conventional way of understanding it. So this is the state of consciousness targeted by television and its commercials. In this state, I may have genuine accomplishments. I have only conventional ways of self-appreciation. For example, the approval of others or some social position I get. My self-reflection constantly replays the unsolved problems of my childhood. Now, we all have that. Our self-reflection still replays the unsolved problems of our childhood. But in the deeper states of consciousness, that's objective. It becomes, so I can hear, I say, oh, Oh, Mom, are you still saying that? You know, I can hear that voice. I can, I can see the bullies on the corner ganging, ready to gang up on me. You know, I mean, but it's objective. It's not, and when I was younger, it wasn't objective at all. Okay, so, so in this, this state, I don't really know what I want. I, I am amazed at how many people just don't know what they want, and the idea what do you want is a revolutionary question. I don't know what I want. And that's why television keeps flashing at you. Want this, want this, want this. Because they know you don't know what you want. And so you're prey for all these commercials they throw at you. I don't know why I'm ashamed or scared or angry. And I often believe that other people are real cause of my problems. If I'm in trouble, I find it difficult to ask for help or to accept help. And if I'm ill, I'm likely to be passive to a doctor's view of my condition. Now we all have this little, that level in us, and I know I do. But that view for most of us, I would say, is more or less objective. And in the deeper states of consciousness, that view is objective. So I can hear the voices, I can hear the voice saying, well, but the doctor says this, and I say, <laughs> Sorry, Doc. <laughs> the doctor knows what he knows, and I know what I know. And I got a good doctor who actually knows that, so. Okay, so. You saved that one. <laughs> I did. It was a good save. It was a good save? Yeah. yeah. Okay, there are many, many variations on this theme, and not all condition applies to all people, and some kind of elevation of the persona can make some of the bad effects seem to recede, be that as it, as it may, is an uncentered state of no particular selfhood other than a conventional one. And I think we call this a state of collective identity. This picture, this picture has an error in it. It shouldn't have a center in it. I call this picture the desert of the senses. And the coloring in this picture is intentional. And what that pick and so make believe the center isn't there. What? The dot? You're going to do that. The dot? Yeah. I have that mistake in the paper. What? The dot? Yes. The dot shouldn't be there. Oh, okay. Right. Because this picture has no center. Okay. And what this shows is the square, the the problem of the senses where 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 this state of consciousness is. And in the background there's these triangles which are um speaking of the next state of consciousness, which is, it, it appears and disappears, it appears and disappears. I have a big success and suddenly the next state of consciousness appears and it may be for a little while I'm healed and then the square comes back again. Okay, so this is, that's why I call it the desert. Okay, any questions about this? So the, this all clear? The Go. square there, is, the, is that the, the blue around? The green, yellow, it's that sort of sickly greenish color. <laughs> oh, oh, I see. Oh, I get it now. I, I missed that. Okay. Yeah, I get it. But I, I have a question. Is there any reason that you came up with the square representing what it does and the triangle representing what it does? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> but I think if you looked into it deeply, you'd come to the same conclusion. The triangle... <laughs> The triangle is the basis of the circle. Uh, every, every triangle has its own pet circle. You draw the circle with the, using the three points on the triangle and there's only one. The triangle is intimately related to the circle. 
but a square is a funny relation to a circle. You know, just imagine sitting on a circle with a square and it's squash. It's a, so the triangle's stable and the square isn't. The triangle holds the circle and the square doesn't. So I'm, so I'm not starting with the numbers one, two, three, four, because that, that's counting. I'm not counting. I'm starting with the circle. The soul lives in a circle. And this, the most cogent representative of the circle is the triangle. And the problematic representative of the circle is the square. And we live in our lives where we have these cogent things that are certain and these problematic things. And no matter who we are, we live with them. Right? So the triangle and the square are absolutely fundamental. To my, to, so that's the way I'm thinking. Yes? We don't have to agree, just to understand oh, what yeah. I mean. Yeah. Uh, uh, as long as you have a, a basis for deriving at Yeah, that's where I'm, that's where I'm doing, right. Okay. So to kind of backpack off of that, so is it that the the, squ the square, as opposed to a triangle, the square is more static, and then the triangle allows for like transformation and dynamism as a as a shape. I wouldn't say the square is static. Okay. I would say that the square is is uh, divided against itself. If I want to ask what something is, and I say what is it really, mm -hmm. I'm in a deep square. I take the microscope and the microscope says, oh, look at that, that, that's what it is. Then I find a better microscope. That, oh, look at that, look, there's what it really is. Then I find a better microscope. And, and as soon as I ask what something really is, I'm in a square. If I know what it is, then I don't ask what it is. I don't have to ask what, get in my car and ask what it is. I'd never be able to drive. You know, as Tony used to tell this old joke about uh, the centipede, you know, somebody asked him, how do you keep all your legs coordinated? And he started thinking about it, couldn't walk in. <laughs> so, I mean, it, so we have to know where's the triangle and where's the square. And the triangle is where we know what we're doing, and the square is where we don't know what we're doing. And the square is hard work. The triangle can be hard work too, but it works. It might not even be knowing what you're doing, it's just what happens naturally. Okay. In the triangle, something's in flow and happens naturally, and you haven't even gotten to a question. Right. You don't need to question. There's no need, no need to ask the question because it works. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, we good? Can I move on? Move on. Okay, so this says ordinary life center. Now, this picture is the zodiac as it's usually used. When I look at the zodiac, I look at the sign, I say, what triangle is it in and what square is it in? So if I look at Aries, Aries is cardinal fire. That means it's in the square called cardinal and it's in the triangle called fire. And mostly that's my view of the zodiac. If I look at, if I try and find out the relation between Aquarius and Virgo, <coughs> this picture's no help. So, and I think this is a very accurate picture, and to me it represents a state of consciousness that's very important. And that a lot of what we're doing when we teach self-help, when we teach astrology, is to try and bring people out of the uncentered state into this one. Because in this state, life makes sense. In the uncentered state, life does not make sense. They can pretend about it, they can... They can play whatever game they play, they can be good at the game, they can be bad at the game. Life does not make sense. And in this state, life begins to make sense. And that's worth having. Okay? So, that's why I'm talking about it as a state of consciousness. So, note the squares are inside the triangles. Can you see that in the picture? The, the lines of the triangles form the squares. So they, this, this shows the relationship between the triangles and the squares. The squares are inside. You see it? No. Go point it out with your finger. Yeah. Do we have a pointer here? Yeah. Uh, David, David, David point it. Yeah, he's, 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 David's your pointer. David's the pointer. Can you see, you see who's pointing? See, yeah. You see the, the yeah. lines of the squares? That's, that's one square. That's one. That is one. And here's another square. Squares. Yeah. 
Look at the triangles and look at the first point that comes off them. You'll see those, there's where the squares are. Okay. Just on hand money, I'm not intuiting it. How many squares are there? <laughs> well, it's a 12 pointed star. So there's six. four triangles, there's three squares. If you go down in the middle, down farther, you'll find there's two hexagons. Okay? So there's three squares? Yep. Oh, yeah, okay. Go back to the three squares, and that would take account for the four edges of the third pentagon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. If you look in the, on the website, you'll find that there's a paper of mine called The Structure of the Twelve-Pointed Star, and it goes into this in great detail, into what this star, this, uh, star is like. And you might enjoy reading that. If you want, I could go do that now if you want. Well, check well what do you want to do? No. Well, if there's enough questions about, to me, that understanding the star is really important mm -hmm. because it just shows how, what things. Can you find it, David? Can you find the? It's on the stick. Um, Should be here. Yeah. Lenny, Lenny, I go to a, a, a backstepping. What, what do you mean, ordinary light centered? What does that mean? Which paper are you wanting to see? The 12 pointed star? Yeah, 12 yeah. pointed star. Or the triangle in the cabinet? No, the 12 pointed star. No. 12 pointed star 1? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I don't want to download it. You don't want to download it. Why not? That's a great question. Why not? Really? Yeah. Four inches. Okay. No, I have the same question as Carol. Yeah, me too. Lenny? Yeah. <laughs> There's a question. Yeah, on the, on the table. <laughs> Come on, ask. What is meant by ordinary life centered? Okay, I'm getting there. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Good. Uh, what's happening here? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh, no, 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 never mind that. Yeah, I think we don't want to download. We don't want to download, no. Okay. 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 So here, let me let me go and read what I say about it, okay? Right hand corner. Right, yeah. And now that's words, so you want to put Okay, here's what I want to say. If I'm in this state, it's because I've heard or glimpsed something I wouldn't have heard or glimpsed in the unsentient state. I've heard that life has a real attainable goal. Or I've heard of the self, capital S. Or, I've glimpsed that religion has a deeper than conventional truth. Or, I've glimpsed something overwhelmingly beautiful. I've heard or glimpsed, and this hearing or glimpsing has made a difference in how I think of life. Okay, this, that's what I'm starting to refer to here. In the lower states, life is just a game. You play it well, or you play it badly. Reality, truth, beauty, these are just words. Here, life becomes real, capital R. This is no state of self-realization, and yet it is a realization of a sort, and would that it were more widely sought. One goal of teaching any form of self-help, astrology included, is to bring the student from the unrelated state to this one. The new light reveals a, collection, a connection of inner and outer events to the unrelated con consciousness. This is revolutionary. In this state, I've at least heard of a self that's larger and more important than the collective self. Okay, that's what I mean by ordinary life center. The center comes from my experience of beauty or truth or wonder or that I've, that I've seen something or I've heard something or, or in some ways I've had a love that just was just got to me. Something happened that moved me out of this uncentered state and into a state where life started feeling real. Okay, that's what I mean by when you're life-centered. And I don't mean to be, you know, the geometry makes it seem like I'm talking about some radical change from ear to ear. That's not really so. These things are much more gradual. Many people live in a state that's half-centered and half-uncentered. Um, 
I could live in a state where I'm more or less centered, and then something comes up that throws me, and that same thing comes up, always throws me, it pisses me off, and uh, or it gets me ashamed, or however it works, and then I'm not myself again for a month or a, or a while, you know? And so we go back and forth between these states, but the fact that there's a center that appears sometimes is rather wonderful. And um, I would love to have, say, my sister get just a taste of something like this. It would change her whole life. Just a taste of something like this. My sister, my brother-in-law, just the pe these people I love who I would love so much to just get that little taste to it. I'm not doing it. It's not given to me to do it. And I'm sure that you could relate to that, having someone you really would just love to believe in something real. Yeah, and so, so that that's what I'm trying to say. That that ordinary life gets a center by something real happening. Okay, is that that good? Very good, good answer. Yeah, yeah. And so, and and that ordinary life center. And I'm trying to put this zodiac, this ordinary zodiac, the triangles and squares, as a symbol for that. And in truth, then when we when we present astrology to people, we are presenting that life is a, has a center. Whether it's your chart or whether what's going on in the sky, we're presenting that life has a center. Things mean something. Things are happening. They're not just happening. Something's going on, and you can tune in on what's going what on. Hmm? And you don't know what it is. Don't know what it is. <laughs> okay. Good. Are we good? Okay. The next chapter, and I call it two A, is meditation, and I'm using the word meditation here. Um, sort of take the little license here in that word, and I'll explain what I mean. So the static circle is a 12-fold, and the dynamic circle is an 8. For example, we just passed through Beltane the 1st of May, and that's what people usually mean by spring. When people complain about early spring, they complain that Beltane hasn't come yet, because Beltane is when the flowers really come out. And Beltane is when you look and say, ah, look, the maple trees are coming out in spring. And the early spring, people are very impatient with that, early, that wild end of winter that happens when you can still get a blizzard and then it can be 60 degrees the next day. People don't like that. Okay? So this is the dynamic circle is an eight. And this eight, I've just drawn a picture here of this eight. This is an eight pointed star. That's a whole, it's a whole different thing from, from the 12 point. Each one of these stars has such a remarkable personality all its own. <coughs> we're not, you see, we're not using numbers anymore to count. It's not <coughs> 8 plus 4 isn't 12. There's no such thing going on here. How could you add 4 to this and get 12? It's not, these, these are numbers that have their own personality, each one. And the 8 has this particular personality. You can see, I don't know if you can actually see, can you see the two squares? Mm -hmm. that, that should be seen there. Yeah, and I've yeah. highlighted the eight in the middle, that's a, a stop sign. And I really like it, calling it a stop sign. It seems very appropriate that it's a stop sign. Okay, and I'm calling this a symbol of meditation. And the next one shows a star of two squares. And this shows the dialogue of the square with itself. That's a whole different kind of sense world, the dialogue of the square with itself. It means that we get to understand the details of things. It means that we get to look into an, a sense object and see what's going on. We get to understand, oh, that's what's happening. We get to look at the details, and looking at the details, we get to see what the thing is. And it's an entirely different thing. It's like a dialogue. That's what the word dialogue means. It means it means a conversation between two things, and there's a dialogue between two squares. And it's entirely different from the square. The square is frustrating, and this thing is a way of doing things. So, the eight star, I saw a book cover, and I wish I could find it, and maybe some of you would know of it, which has this, this star on its cover. It was a book about the dervish dance. If you find it, let me know. No, that wasn't the one. Okay, the dialogue of the two squares suggests the struggle of the sense world reflecting on itself, a self-reflected vital sense consciousness investigating its own details. 
So the central octagon is a stop sign. And here the investigation of details comes to an end. And this is something that a lot of scientists don't understand. The goal is control of the senses, their conversion to a usable energy, and not an endless multiplication of details. The endless multiplication. <coughs> Let me go on and see if you agree or disagree with me. Okay, in this stop sign, the octagon has been rotated from its position. What does this mean? I'm saying the rotation stands for the conscious act of recognizing the silence is the goal of working with the energy. This silence is a result of completion, so that meditation dissipates on completion of the goal and does not become a goal in itself. Okay, so if meditation is a goal in itself, that's not what I'm talking about. Um, in this view, meditation is an investment of vital energy leading away from the worldly life towards the self. This isn't, strictly speaking, a level of selfhood as a discipline, ranging for something casual or athletic at its lower levels to something mystical at its upper levels. And I'm not giving you a full description of it because I don't get it anyway. So ideally, meditation leads to an experience of the self. But this is not necessarily so. It may be all by itself a place to live, where the world disappears for a time and the interior world begins to take shape. This applies to the world of the artist, the nature lover, the musician, the athlete, the wanderer, the lover, and virtually anyone who lives with energy somewhere beyond or outside the ordinary. And that's what I'm saying is the real character of meditation. That's what we want to get in meditation. We want to live somewhere else. And a lot of people live somewhere else who aren't meditating. They're living somewhere else. And they like it. This person doesn't have to be find anything and doesn't have to be looking. If you read Hess's novel, Narcissus and Goldman, he's talking about such a person there. Because Goldman isn't looking for anything. He's living life and drinking it deep. So this generic notion of meditation probably isn't to everyone's taste. I'm sure there's some here in this room who disagree with me about using the word that way. There's a lot of lives in which the word meditation is unfamiliar or even denied. Deliberate oriental style meditation is only one kind, and if it's done with insufficient energy, it isn't even meditation in this sense. And this is, my own first <coughs> intense experience of this kind came when I was a math graduate student, and I was really quite an ordinary, I mean quite an ordinary selfhood then, but I was working so hard at the mathematics that I was working 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, I'd wake up in the middle of the night, the mathematics would be going on in my mind, and uh, I was essentially studying Zen, but I was calling it mathematics, and I had some really amazing experiences, um, but I didn't have any idea what I was doing. And uh, when I met Tony, it was like a drink of water to a drowning to a man who was um, completely dry, because I had no idea where my experience had brought me. Certainly nowhere than any mathematician that I knew had any idea of. So, these are interesting experiences, these <coughs> what I'm talking about here and calling it meditation. Mm -hmm. Could you speak up? Yeah. I'm first getting his permission. <laughs> yeah, come on. You don't need my permission. Um, it's, um, this is very graspable, if you, th to me anyway, if you think about semi-squares and sesquipadrates in the sense that we, we, we could substitute a lot of words, I think, for what Lenny's calling meditation. But if you think about a square as an experience, I don't know anything about math, so Lenny and I have these conversations about words versus numbers, but if you think about a square, as an experience obstacle, something that stops you in your tracks, 
you have to push against, right? I mean, a common notion is a square presents an obstacle in life. And the semi-square, so if you, if you think about your chart and you look at a square and you calculate the 45 degree angle or the semi-square between the two points that are at right angles. <coughs> To me, that's a tantric point, what Lenny's calling meditation. That's a point where the energy of outwardly facing an obstacle is ingested and transformed <coughs> in self rather than, for example, hitting a roadblock straight on. You know, you know. So a semi-square offers a conversion point, what Lenny's calling meditation, where some energy that is hitting obstacle is actually realized within and transformed within self is my experience of me. And and when Lenny's talking about the four as the equinox solstices points, the cross quarter holidays, Beltane, Lamas, Salween, Candlemas, those are conversion points between the equinoxes and solstices. So there's something of, would you, you, when you say more subtle energy, more subtle level of consciousness that's able to take hold of the square and transform it within self, is my understanding of what you mean by meditation. Yeah. yeah. I just use the word meditation because it, <clears throat> it's a likely word. I don't know what word to use. It's really about the energy. It's about getting a hold of the energy and living in the energy instead of living in the senses. And living in the energy makes somewhere where I'm closer to myself than I am living in merely in the object. And so it's a transformational stage and med to me meditation aims at such a thing, but um, so could falling in love aim at such a thing. And there's, I'm not trying to pick one over the other, it's, it's, um, it's moving towards the self, away from the world. So it's not, it's not in, in this, we're talking about the zodiac here, the zodiac actually disappears in this state. I'm not really interested in the question of the whole of human experience or whether it has a whole or not. If I'm really in this state, the state where I'm transformed by the energy, I don't give a damn. Where I am is is adequate to itself, and I'm living in a completely <coughs> adequate place, and I don't want to ask questions. I don't want it to disappear. I want it to be just fine. And I may be going somewhere. I may have a goal, or I may not. And I don't care. So, and a lot of people live here, and it's quite a nice place to live. Go. You know, um, P.B. often uses the example of someone absorbed in reading <coughs> as, as an example of uh, a meditation state. You know, like, talks, sometimes he uses the word reverie, mm -hmm. a reverie, but they're just absorbed in what they're reading, so they're really not very much as we're in the sensible right. world when they're reading. Is right. that... Definitely. <coughs> Definitely. Or you could see a musician. Mm -hmm. I know most of the musicians I know who are any good don't spend much time in the sense world. And Michael, you could say in reading or in geometry. Because when doing geometry, <coughs> literally using the tools and drawing the figures, you can get, I think, absorbed in the same way of Okay. If, you want, if you're appreciating art, you want to be absorbed in the same way. It's just no. There are thousands of ways, and you can invent your own. Okay. So the next star I'm I'm, I'm drawing on here. The next star is a 360-135. I keep wanting to refer these things to a 360 because. <coughs> the 360 is, is hanging around in the background of all of this. So this is, this is a, if I could, if I drew that star out for you in a movie, you would see 
that there are eight pointed stars and there are 45 of them. And there's one that's highlighted. And there's 45 eight pointed stars. 45 times eight is 360. And this is another 360 pointed star. And each each one of these stars is a 360-pointed star that highlights a certain state of consciousness. But because the 360 is present, it highlights it against the background of the whole of life. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to present here. So the next picture. The next picture is the 360-135. But I put the 12 star in the center. Now that on the outside there, there's 45 eight-pointed stars, but there's the 12 star in the center. <laughs> so that might picture say, well, here I am meditating, or I'm in some reverie, some intense reverie, and here's ordinary life, which is in the foreground. <coughs> it's in the foreground. It's not where I'm living living in the background, I'm living in this intense reverie that I want to live in. And I'm not ignoring ordinary life, but I'm not giving it first priority. Yeah. So this could be a picture of a reverie. But again, if you could zoom in on the construction of the star, like we zoomed in before, you would see that the 12-pointed star, the triangles, are made up of lines they're from the eight-pointed star, and all of these stars are driven are drawn that way. So try to zoom in. Do you want to do it, <coughs> You'd have to check. find the GeoGebra file for it. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Is that hard? You won't be able to zoom in on this. It's right. just in the PDF. If anybody needs it, but I it wouldn't. I think if some people came who didn't see the first movie, and I think it'd be great to see another one because it really shows how it how it's created. David, you have to you'd have to find this on the stick. stick. Yeah. Okay. Well, here's the stick. You, you want to see the movie? Then yeah. Just reduce that screen and go back to GeoGebra and run the GeoGebra. Yeah, it's not here. GeoGebra is open. So. Yeah, so the GeoGebra is already. Yep. Yeah, but I want to, You'd have to go back on the stick and get the particular file for so that. Where is it in levels of open? Yeah. Oh. And you'd have to find the <coughs> pages. Sorry. Uh, ten. Page 10, look, look in page 10. Yeah, we need a Georgia, we need one of these Georgia before, oh, page 10. Yeah. Okay. Is that it? That's yeah. it. Great. The, yeah, that's it. You should sure. open in Georgia. Aha. Uh -huh. There it is. Now you can, if you can show the movie of this one, okay. show it how it's done. So I gotta get it. A little smaller and center it. Yeah. There. And I'll bring up the, the um, <coughs> right mouse. I'll just right come mouse click for navigation bar. Right yeah. mouse and look for navigation bar. There you are. Navigation bar. Okay, now move the picture down. Yeah. Okay. Okay, now give me give me one second here. One second. Yeah. Uh, that's twelve. We'll be here all night. If you go on the arrow, <laughs> the arrow will take you down. <laughs> uh, oh, the arrow. Yeah. Okay. Oops. Oops. Oh, the other one. Mm -hmm. The arrow doesn't want to do that. So no, because you put a twelve in there and it doesn't know what to do with the twelve. Yeah, I know. You got a backspace. Right over here. So cool, isn't it? This is how this picture is constructed. They're all different colors. Some of the colors were just random and some of them were deliberate. I left out. <coughs> okay, and now we're going to draw triangles. It really helps 
to see the movie then. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. It really helps us. People like me can't see it. Mm -hmm. No, is there that kind of geometry in them? Yeah, they might really be interested in them. Honeycombs. Mm -hmm. I've looked at sunflower seeds. They got all kinds of neat spirals <coughs> in them. Okay, so you get an idea of how this picture is drawn. And uh, David, if you could come down to the zoom down to the edge of one of the triangles there. Sure. You can see how the lines, that, that crosshatch of lines, yeah. is the eight-pointed stars. Mm -hmm. And you can see how the triangles are drawn <clears throat> in the eight-pointed stars. Mm -hmm. And the point, the way you draw these pictures is to calculate exactly how many levels to come down, down here. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, the eight-pointed stars are at 135-degree angle, and the triangles are at 120-degree angle. If you could count there, you could say I came down 15 levels and I, and, and I came to that point. Mm -hmm. And if I came down 15 levels and just trace, I will draw the triangles. The triangles will be right there. Okay, and this, the uh, structure of these stars is quite amazing, and, but you have to touch it and feel it for yourself to even to believe what I'm saying because I got kind of overwhelmed myself in doing all these mm -hmm. things. Drawing these things. Did you see what Lenny's talking about? The levels mm. it took me a while. The, the first level would be right mm. there, right where the arrow is. Right. right. That's one of the four. That's the first level. Right. This would be the second level. Mm -hmm. And then you go all the way down, you get to the back. Yeah, That's 15? 15, yeah. Mm. And all of these stars are like that. There's some internal arithmetic that says exactly what the structure of it is, and if I understand the arithmetic and I count it correctly and I just follow the lines, I will draw the figure I think ought to be there. I think the way I actually did this was I found one of those points and drew a circle, and then that's how I knew how the other points were. The circle doesn't appear here. But I'm sure there's a hidden circle in there someplace. That's all I got where they were. There's a circle that appears as if there is a circle. Yeah. Well, the circle's hidden. It's there somewhere. No, I mean just what meets the, the immediate sense perception. It's a circle, right? It appears. <coughs> <coughs> okay. Mm -hmm. We good? More questions? I'm sure there are... There are thousands of questions because I've drawn hundreds of these pictures and I can't convey it to you what it's like to draw these pictures because I've drawn hundreds of them. So the only way, the only, if you actually wanted to know about these things, you would have to get there and draw them yourself. There's no way. I mean, you know, I mean, somebody can, can talk to you about playing the piano until you get your hands on it and see what it's like. You can't. What, what do you know, right? And somebody could talk to you about drawing, about art about painting and until you've gotten your hands on the colors and got an idea of what color is like and, and what it's like to use a brush and what the different strokes come out and look like, what do we know? So basically I'm just trying to convey to you something about these pictures because these pictures are marvelous to me. And I've literally drawn hundreds of them. Okay. Do you want to show a few more movies? Want to see some more movies? I've got to hear what you have to say. Mm -hmm. Peg, what? Okay. Um, how did you get? <clears throat> how did you get the intuition of the meaning of these different stars? I mean, did it come to you intuitively? I don't know. I assume so. <laughs> but I mean, it. I was in the middle of the stream before I noticed I was swimming. Mm. I was it was I was up to my ears in it before I noticed. Oh wow, 
there's a big intuition going on here. Because I was just, I, I don't know, I was, uh, it was David's wife who told me about this program, GeoGebra, and, and uh, I don't know when I started figuring out that I could draw these stars. And then I wrote a program that generated the equations for the stars, because, you know, 360-pointed star, I did not draw them by hand, I promise you. <laughs> And um, so I had, to, I had to generate some, some uh, computer program that generated equations for them. And so now I can draw one of these in a couple of minutes. Um, and, but I don't know, it, it's, I think it was in that first star, the one that starts this paper, the first star. When I drew that one, I said, uh-oh, I'm, I'm in something here. Because that, it was really clear to me that I had the zodiac as something finite. And that was worth pursuing. And then I could, you know, there's a, pass this step picture back to her. See, I, I, there's some other, this isn't part of the 360. This is 108. And 108, you know, the rosary beads are 108. And I say, well, 108's got to be some special number. And so I draw them a picture. And that picture's a 27-pointed star sitting in 108. And to me, what that star symbolizes is I'm learning how to shout in prayer so that I can pray loud enough so that the overself can hear me. And that picture says something like that to me. Now, a lot of these pictures don't say anything because I don't understand them. Yeah? That one I seem to understand. But, um, and I drew it in a way that expressed that understanding. Yeah, to some of these people, I don't these pictures. I don't even know if my drawing expresses what I understand because I'm, I'm not sure I get it. Do you understand where I am? I'm in the middle of this, and I'm hoping I can swim. Okay. Anybody want to see the picture? Great. <clears throat> Do you want to put that one up, Randy? I don't know if it's in there. No. What's it called? What What's it called? 27. It's not in the papers. Oh. <laughs> you just happen. We just happen to have a drawing of it and brought it along. Manny, do you want to share this paper? If people want it, I can send it to them. It's on the. It's, it's on the. Website. Uh, it's on the website. It's on the website. <coughs> okay. So. Back in the paper. Okay, so we've, we've done that. So the next one is a 360 144 with the 8 star inside it. Now here what I've got is the 8 star is, is drawn with 5s above it. And, now, and this, this picture, to me this represents the meditation reaching for the self. And in the next chapter I'll show you what I mean by the 5 as the self. Okay, but this this picture sh it should suggest to me that I don't know if you can see the five point stars behind it. This suggests that this is the goal of this intense activity. Up to now, we've been dealing with threes and fours, and when it comes to the five, it's startlingly different. And um, I have this argument with Euclid that Euclid doesn't express how startlingly different the five is. He pisses me off. Startling. Startlingly. Star. Hmm. Startling, right? Because the five in this five, there's nothing of what was there in the three and the four. The pentagon in the center, and if you look in the center of that, there's another five-pointed star in there, and there's another pentagon in the center of that. This five-pointed star is an entirely different creature. And so, let me read some of what I have to say about it. I won't go too far. So, the previous states can be achieved. It would seem by a combination of study, effort, and talent. Really, really, we could say that the previous states are within the scope of the ordinary human who's, who's got the talents, who's willing to work hard enough, OK? 
Okay? But this state, <coughs> this state, finding my own soul, is achieved only by grace. There's no hard, no amount of work I could do to achieve this state. It either comes to me or doesn't, and I might deserve it or not, and I might act like I deserve it or I might act, act like I don't, and I, I just have some things to say about that. So this, this is symbolized by the pentacle, and in my life I've called this particular kind of grace the skyhook, because it seems to suddenly come from above and lift me to another place entirely. And if I'm honest, and mostly I'm not, if I'm honest, I soon realized I suddenly don't know where who I, where or who I am, just that I'm not in Kansas anymore. Mm -hmm. And many times I've gone back and read Jung's essay on the power personality, and I recommend everybody should know something about that essay. Um, it's in two essays on analytical psychology. It's in the second essay. It's called The Mana Personality. And he says, watch out, because victory can be very dangerous in these things. So the previous states are all expressed by threes and fours, and this five is a sudden intrusion. And here's the next, the next picture will show you something of the interior structure of the Pentagon. There are fives inside of fives inside of fives. And you know the parable which says that uh, there's a Buddha sitting in a temple and meditating and in, in his belly button is a mustard seed and inside the mustard seed is another temple and there's another Buddha meditating and inside his belly button is a mustard seed and so on and so on. This is the five point star. Each interior has another interior. Each interior has another interior. And okay, so the self is discovered as many interiors. I hope I'm get I hope you're feeling uncomfortable because this is uncomfortable. Because up till now, it's been, I think, very comfortable. And we could say, oh yeah, I know that. Oh yeah, I could see that, oh yeah. But right at this point, I don't think I could say, oh yeah, I know that. Because I'm very uncomfortable with this part. I'm just trying to get comfortable. Thank you. Well, you, you earlier said it was like a poem. And, and, yeah. I, and I'm feeling a little bit of that. Of the poetry of, yeah. of your presence. Thank you. Yeah, it is. Calling it grace, and we're talking about quintiles and pentacles. And okay, we'll see. But it's, maybe what you mean by uncomfortable is not quite graspable by the end. Some things are interior. We're talking about the so the self thus discovered as many interiors. What what happens here? Here's what Anthony says. Let me let me cheat. <laughs> If a person reaches a state in meditation where he goes into the void mind, that principle we call the reproductive soul that always wants earthly embodiment dies. When you come out, you still have an ego, but the function of egotism is gone, no longer there. And you are now at what the Sufis call the first of three stations. Now you have realized that the ego is absolute emptiness. It's nothing. There is nothing there. This is what that five is saying. It's saying the threes and fours we're talking about is nothing. It's a matrix of thoughts and possibilities that revolve around the imaginary center. You have realized this in the void. After you have realized the emptiness of your own ego, there becomes a long training. Now, the problem is that we realize the emptiness of our own ego, but our reflection does not get it. Mm. Our reflection doesn't get what's happened. We can have realized the emptiness of the ego, but the reflection is still the same old reflection it was before, except something isn't clicking about it, right? So after you realize the emptiness of your own ego, then begins a long training. It could be a very long training. It's like the higher stole starts instructing you. And when you go through that training, it's the second station. Mm. 
And you know, like they say in the rushing fairy tales, it was a long time or, is it, or a short time, and words are easy to write, but experience takes a long time. And we're, this is what's going on here, because it could be a very long time to the second station. And then the third station is when the soul permanently takes possession, and that's the stage of the sage and philosopher. And they no longer have an ego like you and I. Their ego is dead, and that's a very high spiritual stage. So what we're talking about here is the first stage. And the first stage, to me, is the beginning of the path. We could say we're on the path, but until I came to this first stage, I didn't think I had any idea what the path was. The quest was just something I knew of by rumor. And I came to this that experience, and then I had some idea of what the quest was. Because I had some idea of who was going to travel it. So this, so and, and this thing, Anthony said on many occasions, when you see what I'm really talking about, they'll come through rocks at my windows. Did you ever hear him say that? Mm -hmm. He's talking about this state, about this realization. Anybody want to say anything? Well, you um, talk about this as uh, grace. It seems to me that grace could happen without the, the very deep experience that Anthony has described in that paragraph. It doesn't have a label on it that says, I just went into the void and my ego's dead. Mm -hmm. Okay. I come out of the experience and I'm still, I'm still Lenny. And it only gradually do I realize the number of things that are dead and the, the number of things that don't make sense anymore. And it's, it's, and the image I use is like, have you ever seen how a sycamore tree looks when its bark is hanging off it, the strips of bark hanging off it? That's the way I felt. I felt that my old personality was hanging off me in that kind of um, very unglamorous way. There was no way to disguise the fact that I didn't know who I was. That I didn't know what happened to me. I guess I would, I would be comfortable with saying there was some grace that happened. I'm not so comfortable saying that um, that this was the state in which the person <coughs> entered into the void and is seen, or there's been some existential removing of the ego. And I agree with you that there is there is a stage where there is some kind of grace, and that's you know Anthony would say something like, well, like you said, now you're on the quest. Now you know who right. your enemy is. I just, I just, I'm just not sure that that quote of Anthony's goes. To me, they're just not the same thing. Well, I, I think, Michael, if, I, if, if I'm understanding you, if I'm understanding you, really, there's two things that are being conflated. One is the experience of being lifted somewhere, which I think is the pentacle, the pentagram that Lenny's trying to describe. It's a whole other thing what happens when you get plopped back down into the ordinary state of consciousness. And you're talking about the more one package in a way. Right. So that's, I think, why he used the quote, first station, second station, mm -hmm. third station. Mm -hmm. Because this configuration, which in astrology we call quintile, is that state of Dorothy. the awareness of a wider angelic, you might mean there's different names in every tradition, but that wider mystical state of consciousness. But but that alone doesn't say what's going to happen when you lose sight of that, or what's going to happen when you come back into the ordinary state, right? So that's a whole other discussion. I think too it might be uh, 
different takes on what it means to say the ego is or is dead. Yeah, yeah. It might be more modest to say that you can actually never believe again that the ego is who you are. Mm -hmm. You know, this is being recorded, so maybe speak up a little. I like that formulation. Say it again, Randy. Maybe instead of saying that the ego or the egoism is dead, it's like from that moment onward you can never completely believe that the ego is who you are. Mm -hmm. So it's not getting fed by every pulse of your heart. Like yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in, a, in a sense, right. with that idea, if you look at the large pentagon, and then look at the pentagon that's within the large pentagon, and it's inverted relative to the larger pentagon. And each, each iteration, as you go more deeply in, that inversion occurs. And so, in a sense, in the, cent in the center there, you could kind of think of that so-called, what, what I'm calling an inverted pentagon, as turning the ego on its head. Mm -hmm. So, Lenny, as the artist and the person who created this, um, the, 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 the sycamore, the stripping, the shedding, was was that like when you re-entered um, after the grace? Or yeah, that's who I felt myself to be. Okay. I, I couldn't figure out who it was. My mother, I wrote this in the paper, mm -hmm. my mother never figured out who it was. Mm -hmm. She could not find me in again. And how old were you when this happened? 36. Okay. All right. So, thank you. Well, well, in my understanding of Fana, the state, that first station of the Sufis, is that it's permanent, it's that right. permanent, mm -hmm. that when you reach that station of ego annihilation, fana literally means annihilation, and you know, in, in Arabic that's what it means, and my understanding is that it's permanent, it's like you just, you're done, mm -hmm. you're done with identifying with the ego, and yes, I'm sure there's a very long training, because the next station is like a mystical union with the oversell, so mm -hmm. I, I'm not, I mean, I think there are little faunas, maybe, or not faunas, but little depths mm -hmm. along the way. Glimpses. Glimpses, we can call it, if you like. Mm -hmm. But the actual state of annihilation is, it's gone. Mm -hmm. I mean, the I, as I believe I am, I have all my life, and however long I have, it's just done. Susan's gone. Lenny's gone. Everybody's gone, you know. But I might hate it. Oh, well, I don't think there's an I there to hate it. If you hate it, then it's No, no, either. there's an I who's left in my reflection. In your reflection? In my reflection, mm -hmm. there may be a hatred of what's happened to me. I know some people who, who think it was the greatest disaster in their lives when they mm -hmm. had that happen. But my understanding of fauna, and in fact, and in fact, the Sufi scholars call it fauna al fauna, which is even, there's nobody there to even experience the death. There's nobody to hate it. But afterwards. Even afterwards. It's no, afterwards. There's, no. That's why okay. I, I mean, I've done a lot of studying about this. Sure, but I, I'm just saying that among us, there are people who've had that experience and who hate what happened to them. And that's I, I why Tony understand. said you would come throw rocks at my windows. Yes, I do understand what you're saying. I'm and just and even, even if you love what happened to you, it's terribly isolating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree. Because uh, there's that's not clear who's, who's, who's here now. How do I, how do I invent a personality? Right. Yeah, I, before I had the one my parents invented for me, right? right? So not, and he's dead. Yeah. Well, you so said now, at the very beginning that your experience isn't the same as everybody else's right. experience. That's right. My experience is the same as everybody else's. Very point. I agree. Understand here, and so when Lenny describes his experience in terms of the bark hanging off the yeah. sycamore, well, I think I've had experiences with this. And I didn't experience it that way. I would describe my experience of that very differently than the way that right. I described it. Absolutely. Because it's the it's the flame of individuality itself that comes out. It's the real individual that comes out. And and uh, apologies to the Sufis, they want to say he's dead. Well, he's dead, but the over self is there. The over self is there living and the over self is now calling to me, saying, Okay, come on. Now you know now you know something of, of what what I am, of what you are. Come, come realize this. And that that's the kind of death it is. It's Lenny who's dead, but I'm still here. 
it seems from your picture and, and the way you're talking, that what, what I find myself trying to relate to it is this, this sense of the flow of interest. It no longer goes toward the external in a satisfying way. It's the, the, um, the sense of interiority has kind of captured the flow of the attention. Absolutely. And it just it seems bottomless. It could just it's bottomless. It's bottomless. And and what happens is that as as Tony expressed it so nicely, the path begins here. The over self is now instructing me. I am no there's no longer a sense of of free will. I am now following life that I'm being led. And I'm being led to experiences that are gonna complete myself, they're going to solve some problems, there are some problems that I'm going to be very disappointed that I'm not solving um, because there's some things that are just there and I wish they'd go away and they're not going away and I don't have anything to say about it anymore. And uh, it's a very different state from this, the, the ordinary state centered or not. And, um, it's a state that's saw, and we look for it, and we want it, and we get there and say, ugh. <laughs> well, maybe we don't say, ugh. Maybe we say, oh, great, here I am, and, um, and that's just fine. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of my friends have said, ugh. <laughs> and, and my experience, Randy, is that for me, they had immense dimensions in the exteriority because I could just look all around me and see things that I never saw before, isn't right that, in nature. Isn't that neat? It, it's just so obvious when you see it. I never would have seen this geometry before. I mean, it's this, uh, this geometry is the, the, has in it the secret of multiplication, what multiplication is. And honestly, we're taught so badly when we're taught mathematics in schools. We're taught the multiplication is just repeated addition. And um, it just shows how little of a mathematical imagination our teachers have. Because if I look at 12, I can see the multiplication sitting there in the 12 point star. I, it's not a repeated addition. I can see the 4 and the 3. I can see the 6 and the 2. I can see all the multiplication sitting there. That's not repeated addition. Multiplication is, a, is the interior structure of a number. They, there was no way in which in which I was shown any of this, and, I, and in fact, I would say that the teachers I had when I was little had no idea of this. There wasn't anything like this going on for them. So, this. I think I'm. Uh, this is enough for today. I want to. We're going to come back next week and. Um, mm -hmm. At two. At two next week, and I want to start from the five-pointed star and talk some about more about uh, about that and some of the experiences we might have here. Okay, and then go beyond it to the full zodiac. Is that good? Anybody else want to anything Closing else to say? Questions. I want to ask if Severin's here. Severin, are you here? He needs to be here. Thank you, Lenny. 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 Thank you